Hi, everyone. My goal today is very simple. I want to tell you what uh, threshold signatures are, and I want to convince you in the next 20 minutes that if you're serious about Bitcoin security, if you want to protect your wallet, this is a technology that you need. And uh, you know, this is work with a bunch of people at Princeton. Rosario Gennaro uh, is at uh, CCNY. And, and um, uh, to go in a little bit more detail, there are three things I want to tell you today. The first thing I want to tell you is that the banking security model, which has been you know, honed over decades uh, and is very, very refined, has a lot of very sophisticated uh, uh, techniques, process controls for ensuring security, it doesn't translate over really well to Bitcoin. And this might be a little bit unintuitive, surprising at first, but hopefully after I've explained why this is, it'll be sort of obvious in retrospect. And so I want to convince you that you need Bitcoin-specific security technologies. And I want to tell you that multi-signatures is a great option. Uh, you should be using it. On the other hand, you should also be aware that multi-signatures have some serious drawbacks, and these might apply to you, uh, to your specific case, to a greater or lesser degree. And the third thing I want to tell you is explain what threshold signatures are and tell you why they're a form of stealth multi-signatures and why you need them. So the people I want to address most directly today are developers, people at companies, especially developers of wallet software, and so on. And the reason for that is this is still a little bit of an up-and-coming technology. I hope to be back in a year and, and tell everyone that you need uh, uh, threshold signatures even for mainstream consumers. But this is mostly directed at early adopters at this stage. So uh, before I uh, go any further, uh, something a little bit funny, a little bit of an aside. Yesterday in uh, Joy's talk, he waved this paper at you and said some very kind words about it and said, gee, wouldn't it be great if we could bring some of the computer scientists into this room? And so um, I was watching that on live stream. And uh, as one of the authors of that paper, I said, I'm going to be there tomorrow. And I came up here from Princeton. I'm kidding about that last part, of course. I was scheduled to speak. But it was still uh, really awesome to see that sort of uh, uh, dialogue going on. On, and I'm very happy to be here. Uh, Andrew Miller is, is going to be up next, by the way, also one of the authors here. So yeah, at Princeton, we've been uh, you know, um, uh, doing a bunch of research on Bitcoin, sort of from a neutral perspective, talking about both its strengths and weaknesses, um, uh, developing prototype technology that we hope people will uh, take and develop further and adopt, and so on. So let me ask you a question. Who recognizes who this person is? Yeah. Not you, Andrew. Uh, someone else. P yeah? Do you have a guess? Yes, this is Ross Anderson. He is he's a towering figure in information security. He's a professor at Cambridge, and in particular, the economics of information security. And he's worked very deeply with bank security systems. And I would suggest that if you're uh, you know, interested in Bitcoin security, you should read everything that this man has written and, you know, to see what, what extent it applies to Bitcoin. In particular, he's got this wonderful book, Security Engineering. It's available free online. I would highly recommend it. And further, specifically, Chapter 10, Banking and Bookkeeping. This is just wonderful, wonderful stuff. It's just really beautiful, flows so well, and it, he's got so many great insights, and I highly recommend that uh, you take a look at this. Now, the reason I bring this up, the reason I bring this up is that Ross destroys the idea that banking security systems, even though they're digital systems, Ross destroys the idea that they're secure fundamentally because of technological controls. Instead, he points out with so many numerous examples and insights why it's the human processes that banks have and other non-technological uh, you know, audits and ways of recovering your money even if, if it has been lost, and th that's what really keeps banks secure, not so much the access controls and the technology. So that's a really key insight. And you know, if you're not already convinced of it, go read that chapter. You will be convinced of it. And in particular, what I want to tell you is that banks have an undo button. Fundamentally, this is an important and key property of the traditional financial system. Right? You, can you can reverse transactions. You can recover money. And also, you have the whole uh, force of law enforcement and the legal system. It allows you to go after perpetrators of financial crimes. And that acts as a huge deterrent. And Ross explains how you know, it's, in fact, these factors that really keep the financial system secure. Make sense? Of course, banks also do have access controls and technological protection and so on. Uh, but that's, I would argue, a minor part. It's these other detective and corrective measures of security that's really what keeps the financial system secure. And of course, the reason that this is relevant to Bitcoin is that in Bitcoin, we don't have the ability to undo or reverse transactions. And it's really hard to go after 
uh, people who steal money precisely because of the anonymity or pseudonymity of the system. Right? So Bitcoin leaves us with one of these three options and forces us to do the most that we can with access controls and with preventive security. And this is a really key difference to understand, and I'll, and I'll show you in a second what the magnitude of this difference is. It, it can be hard to appreciate at first. Uh, but I want to point out that uh, you know, we often tend to forget this. For example, in the security and usability panel yesterday, great panel, by the way, I really enjoyed it, but people made the point that banks have evolved all these security systems and gradually they will be sort of imported into the Bitcoin context. I think we do have a lot to learn from banks, audits, and so on, but bringing all of that into Bitcoin security, I think is pretty unlikely. And there's always going to be this pretty big asymmetry. So just to emphasize a little bit more how big this difference is, this is another fantastic paper that I think you should read. It's called Nobody Sells Gold for the Price of Silver. And uh, what it tries to emphasize is that uh, the reason that the financial system is secure is not because they have really good ways of making sure somebody can't get to your credentials, but because they have really good ways of making sure that things won't go badly wrong even if somebody gets to your credentials. And here's one statistic that's going to really illustrate this. And this is, again, pulled, a quote pulled from the paper. In the underground market, about the, in one example, 40,000 financial accounts with a face value of $10 million, in fact, traded for an actual market value of a mere $500. Right? What does that tell you? That tells you that even if the first preventive security layer has been breached, even if access control has been breached, the damage that can be caused is so little because of reversibility, because of the ability to go after perpetrators, there is that huge difference, 10 million to 500, in how much credentials are actually worth. Bitcoin does not have this luxury, and that's a fundamental technological property. And that's, of course, the good thing about Bitcoin. We want this irreversibility. We want to cut humans out of the loop. We want very fast transactions, and those are all good things, and that's why Bitcoin is a great alternative to the slow-moving traditional system. But we have to acknowledge that it sort of puts us on the back foot here. In Bitcoin, if somebody gets access to credentials worth $10 million or whatever amount in Bitcoins, then the amount that that's worth to them is exactly $10 million. There's no difference. Right? It, theft is more or less, comparatively speaking, uh, risk-free and irre irreversible. So I think there are great things that we can do to fix this, but I think the first step in solving the security problem is to acknowledge that we have a security problem and to understand how severe the disparity is with the traditional system and to realize that we need uh, Bitcoin-specific security measures. So we're kind of starting off on the back foot here, and in particular, software has never been put in a position, as far as I know, throughout its history, where it has been the sole line of protection for money, but now it is, and we need to deal with that. And software security has not evolved in a way to respond to these really high security uh, requirements. You know, that's why you have Heartbleed, all these bugs with SSL, and Gavin just explained. And that's sort of a cultural phenomenon that's never really going to change it, uh, or it might, you know, well into the future, but it's not ready yet. Software security is not, at this point, ready to handle by itself the stresses uh, that Bitcoin puts it through because every machine with Bitcoin is a sitting bug bounty. Right? There are hundreds of strains of malware which the first thing they do when they infect your machine is look for your wallet file, and Kaspersky Labs reports that over one million infections take place every month where that happens of malware that scans for uh, Bitcoin wallet files. So we need something different. We need Bitcoin-specific security measures. Right. So, of course, multi-signatures, this was brought up uh, a lot in the panel yesterday as well. By the way, so just a quick point before I get to multi-signatures, that, you know, we've all seen this chart, right, of these uh, uh, huge amounts of uh, thefts and losses and so on. We can look at that and say, oh, they were stupid, they didn't have the right procedures in place. That might be true to an extent, but I also want to emphasize that there are fundamental difficulties here with securing Bitcoins, and so uh, that's why we need newer and better technological solutions. Okay, multi-sig, I think it's a great solution. I think you should use it. Uh, you know, just to recap a little bit, the idea is really simple. Uh, you associate n different keys with an address and stipulate that at least m of those keys must sign in order to spend bitcoins from that address. Right? Really simple concept. It's sort of like splitting your keys, but not quite. I'll get to that in a second. <clears throat> 
Now, what it allows you to do, just to, uh, just to imagine how this can be useful, uh, two slightly different ways in which you can use it. You can split those keys between different users, maybe different employees in your company. And what you can say now is that if you have a two out of three multi-signature, for example, even if one of these people gets hit by a bus or leaves the company or turns out to be Russian mafia, whatever, right? you still have the assurance the other two can come together and construct a valid Bitcoin transaction uh, while you, uh, you know, recover from, uh, from this uh, development. And you have the assurance that one single user by themselves can't do anything with that money. So that's good. You can also think of it similarly as three different devices. If one of them gets compromised by malware, for example, the other two can still function normally while you recover uh, from, that, uh, from the hack. Okay, great stuff. But now I'm going to ask some uncomfortable questions about multi-signatures. So the whole point of this is that you can resist these attacks uh, quite well. But let's, let's examine in a little bit more detail what happens when one of these bad events happens. How do you exactly recover from that? What happens when an employee joins or leaves, right? So you have two out of three multi-sig. You have a new person who's coming into that security group. You want to make it two out of four multi-sig. Here's what you need to do. You have to change, you have to move all those Bitcoins on the blockchain into a two out of four address. You can't simply add another key to that. Uh, same thing happens when somebody uh, leaves the system. Uh, if somebody, you know, turns out to be malicious, is fired, you have to do a similar thing. Even worse, what happens if a machine is hacked? Let's say an adversary is trying to get into your system. They deploy some malware that attacks one of those three machines, and they want to find out if it succeeded or not, whether or not it succeeded in compromising that machine. Here's what's going to happen. If it did succeed, you want to recover from that. You want to use the other two devices to what? Move your money to a new two out of three multi-sig address, right? You have to advertise that on the blockchain. You have to publicly wear a badge of shame for any negative events that might affect your security, right? And this, you know, sort of accumulates over time. Every internal change that you make to your security process, every external adverse event that happens, you have to publicly advertise it on the blockchain. Because what multisig tries to do is split your keys intuitively, but that's not what it actually does. It allows you to advertise on the blockchain that you want to use uh, these several different keys. And even in a situation where you have a two out of three multisig with uh, uh, three different people, you have to constantly advertise which two of those people are signing a particular transaction. Right? So you're revealing way too much about the internals of your network and your security uh, policies and practices and current security situation to everybody on the blockchain. And companies that we've talked to have also uh, uh, expressed to us the very same concerns they have over multisig. Despite this, I think multisig is great. I think people should be adopting multisig. I had a student yesterday, or a couple days ago, run some numbers on the adoption of multisig on the blockchain. Uh, Gavin, I know, uh, has said many times that uh, earlier in earlier years that 2014 was going to be the year of multisig. And I think that's turning out to be surprisingly true in a way that he didn't intend, at least so far, which is that what we saw is that adoption peaked in August 2014 and has been falling since. And it peaked at a number that was around 1% of transactions. This is bad, people. I mean, I'm here to tell you the threshold signatures are better than multi-signatures, but multi-signatures are still pretty good and we're not using them. It's not clear why that is, but there really needs to be uh, more adoption of these advanced security technologies for Bitcoin because simple software security is just not going to cut it. Access control measures are not sophisticated enough to distinguish between a malicious insider and a regular use uh, of your funds. So we need multi-sec. Adoption is surprisingly low, uh, tapered off around 1%. And if you count that by fraction of uh, the actual amount of Bitcoins that are being controlled by multi-sec addresses, that number is even much lower. And that, all of that is a cause for concern. So the story gets worse for multi-sig's uh, security properties, though. In particular, anonymity. Multi-sig kind of ruins anonymity. And let me tell you why. A big part of the reason why Bitcoin, we expect it to be pseudonymous in practice for people not to be able to easily trace all of your transactions on the blockchain is this very simple concept. Let's say that a user is buying something from a shop. She's going to construct a transaction. Very often it might look like this. She combines two of her inputs, pays one output to the shop, and the other output is what? That's her change address. 
Great. So our intuition is that somebody looking at the blockchain can't tell which output is the shop and which output is the change address. So uh, that's why they can't trace all of the user's funds uh, as they flow in different transactions through the blockchain over time. Here's what multisig does to that picture. All of the user's addresses, the two inputs in that one output, have a very specific structure. Because if you're using multisig, obviously you want to use it for your whole wallet, right, to protect uh, all of your transactions. And so it's going to be apparent for somebody looking at the blockchain which of these correspond to the user. It gets worse. Same story for CoinJoin, if you're familiar with that. The idea is that different users come together and permute their inputs and outputs basically intuitively in such a way that nobody can tell which input corresponds to which output. But Unless you're in a world where everybody is using multisig, and uh, more than that, everybody is using the same M and N for multisig, what's going to happen is that each of these users is going to have a distinct structure for their address. Right? So these are the problems of multisig. And to sum it up, if you're a company, they reveal too much about your internals to everybody on the blockchain permanently. And if you're an end user, they're bad for your privacy. So how do we fix this? So threshold signatures, even though they're cryptographically quite advanced, the intuition is surprisingly simple. Uh, Multi-signatures you know, don't split your key. They let you use many keys. But threshold signatures do what they, uh, you would intuitively expect them to do, which is they allow you to take any key, and they allow you to split it. And you can manage those different shares of the keys, what we call them internally, in whatever fashion you like. You don't have to advertise that to the world. And that's the key difference. And that's where all the advantages come from. Right? So you don't have to broadcast your security policy to the world. That's what threshold signatures allow you to do. So let me give you some intuition for this. Now, splitting a key, what do I mean by that? We want to make sure that M or more shares can reconstruct the entire key. Right? So that's how you can create a signature. Uh, if M of those devices or people are in the, uh, are, want to participate in a transaction, you want to allow that. On the other hand, for security, you want to make sure that if there are fewer than M people, it provides no information about the key. So this rules out simple solutions like just uh, you know, simply uh, splitting the key into different parts and concatenating them. That won't work, because if there are n minus 1 uh, of the people who are, or devices who are malicious or compromised, that's going to leak quite a lot about the key. And then it won't be too hard to get to the rest of the key. So that's, that won't work. So I'm going to have one slide with math here, but I'll explain it visually, sort of geometrically. What is the key mathematical intuition behind splitting a key? Uh, this is going to be pretty interesting, I think. So let's, let's call your key S. And here's what happens geometrically. What you want to do is you want to draw a point on the y-axis that corresponds to x equals 0 and y equals s. Yeah? We're thinking about this geometrically. Any key, you can represent it as a number. It's going to be a really huge number, so there's a really big graph. That's OK. You don't actually have to draw the graph. Uh, you know, the math is really fast on your computer. So you represent that as a point on the y-axis. The next step, what you do, is you draw a line with a random slope through that point. Random slope is key. You could have picked any slope. You picked this particular one. And now here's what you do. You pick an arbitrary point on that slope. You treat that as a number. And you treat that number as the share of a key. And you give that to one device or one employee. Now, here's what's interesting. If that one employee is malicious, they're going to look at their share of the key. But they have no idea what the slope is, what the slope that you picked in initially setting up this process. Right? So it could be any line through that particular yellow point. And so the red point in the situation, as far as that green user is concerned, could be anything at all. So now they've gotten no information whatsoever about what the secret is and what your key is. Yeah? Single user can't compromise the system. Single device gets hacked, can't compromise the system. But here's what's cool. You keep doing this. You give different points to different users. Any two of them come together. They can draw a line through uh, the two points that they have, see where it intersects the y-axis, and reconstruct the key. Right. So this is the key mathematical intuition behind how you would split a key so that any one person can't do any damage, but any two people. And you can keep doing this. It's not just two out of three. It's two out of any number. Right. And it's not just two out of any number. It's any m out of any number. And you do that. Uh, the math is a little bit more complex, but instead of a line, you draw a different shape. If you had a parabola, for example, you'd need three points to reconstruct that. And fewer than three points gives you no information about which parabola it is. So that's really the simple intuition. That's how you split the key. And yeah, in this situation, any two points can interpolate the secret. 
So what's further cool about this is not just that you can take the split copies of the key and you can put them in your machines however you want. If somebody enters or leaves the system, you can redo this. You don't have to put anything on the blockchain. What's also cool about this is that you can use any access control policy you, you like. You're not, in fact, limited to MRFN. You can say things like, I'm designating these people as employees, regular employees, and these people as managers, and to sign a transaction, at least two employees and at least one manager needs to sign off. All of this it becomes possible with threshold signatures, a much richer uh, set of security policies. So you might be thinking, OK, so you've told me how to split the key, but now I have to reconstruct the key in order to make a signature. And if the machine on which I'm reconstructing the key is compromised, uh, then of course all the security benefits are lost. You've reintroduced a single point of failure. Aha. So the answer to that is um, it, it is, in fact, possible to reconstruct uh, to not reconstruct the key and yet sign transactions, what happens is these different devices execute an interactive cryptographic protocol, at the end of which the key is never reconstructed in any one place, and yet a signature is collaboratively constructed. So I won't go into the math behind that. That's why we wrote a paper, uh, and I'm going to link to it at the end of this talk. And there's sort of a little bit of magic there, but the math is all uh, explained out in the paper. And so this is why we needed to do new research, by the way, to bring this concept of threshold signatures uh, to Bitcoin. The more fundamental concept of splitting a key, that's long been known. It was, in, fa in fact, invented by Adi Shamir, who's the SNRSA. But the math that we did is about uh, this specific part of how do you construct a signature without reintroducing a single point of failure. Right. So let me wrap up really quickly. We have a paper showing how to do this. We also have a prototype implementation. It's a two-factor wallet. What it allows you to do is split your key between your computer and your phone. And in fact, you can do that without ever first constructing the key on any one device. The two devices can, in fact, together construct copies of the key, and the key is never on, uh, on any device, and then you can send money to that sort of joint address. So never at any point in the system, single point of failure. Uh, so this is the kind of the true vision that we wanted, and Threshold Signatures allows you to achieve that. And how that's going to look visually is uh, we just forked multibit to do this, and you initiate a transaction on multibit. It shows you the details, and then you get a pop-up alert on your phone asking you to confirm or reject the transaction. All you need to do is to ensure that the details shown on Multibit on your computer and on your phone match up. And if they do match up, you can be sure uh, that there is no malware on either of those devices. Or rather, even if there is malware, that malware cannot steal your funds. Right. I mean, the whole time you're doing this, your computer could have been compromised by malware, and yet you have the guarantee that as long as one of your devices remains secure, uh, then the transaction you're creating and putting on the blockchain is secure. And the key thing to remember is that after you confirm, there's going to be an interactive protocol. There's a complicated cryptographic back and forth dance of message passing uh, between your computer and your phone, through which they're going to construct that signature without reconstructing the key, and they're going to put that on the blockchain. So we've built this. It works. We have the paper. We have the prototype code. Um, and, and just to summarize, and I'll send you the, uh, show you the link in a second, really what I hope I've convinced you today is that banking has a lot of very sophisticated security procedures. But all of those are mostly able to come to play because transactions are reversible, because you have you know, uh, very strong forms of know your customer. For Bitcoin, we need to do things differently. Multisig is one good way of doing it differently, but it has a lot of serious drawbacks. It, for example, it destroys anonymity and forces you to put your entire security internals onto the blockchain. Instead, threshold signatures are a form of stealth multi-signatures, which is really cool. It allows you to take control of your security and uh, uh, you know, work with us to make threshold signatures ready, ready for prime time. Uh, this is the URL. If you're looking at it right now, just go to freedomtotinker.com. Just Google freedom to tinker. If you're watching this later on video, it may not no longer be the top post, so go to the URL that's at the bottom. It's pr prototype code, of course. It's not quite ready for prime time yet, but with your help, we can make this happen. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, so is the key generated in one place at the beginning, though? That's a great question. So we have, in fact, a distributed protocol even for generating the key. Now, the only caveat is that if, you're already, if you already have a wallet that's not using threshold signatures, that key is already in one place, and you know, we can't do anything about that. But if you want to set up a new wallet, then what we can do is just have your, is to pair your computer and phone and have them talk to each other in such a way that at the end of that process, they'll each have a share of the key, and the uh, whole key was never any, constructed on any device at any point. 
we have that working. Hi. Hi. Yes. So I was very surprised to find out that um, adoption for multi-signal only 1% or so. And uh, um, you know, I was trying to figure out like how you think you improve that and, yeah. and how Threshold is actually going to do better yeah. given the, such a low adoption. Yeah, I think, you know, I think multi-sig is not ideal. Threshold sig can be better. But uh, multi-sig is here now, whereas this is somewhat prototype technology. It's going to take a little bit of time to mature. So for the moment, I think it's still uh, quite important to encourage people to use multi-signatures. My suspicion is that a lot of developers don't understand the ex extent of the disparity that I pointed out at the beginning at, uh, uh, you know, how different the Bitcoin model is from banking security. Uh, the fact that you built... Uh, for example, a social network or even a website that does uh, transactions in the traditional banking system that you were able to build that website and you were able to keep that secure using uh, SSL and applying regular patches and whatnot, that could be fine, but that's still not going to uh, be sufficient for Bitcoin. And I think we need to get the word out there to developers and to convince them that uh, for the moment, uh, the only real way to keep Bitcoin secure uh, is to use multi-signatures. Pardon me? It's about 8%. That's interesting. I stand corrected. It could be that uh, it's a different way of measuring things. I'd love to chat with you later and see uh, what the discrepancy is. But I think we can all agree that, uh, especially if you look at the percentage of Bitcoins that are protected by multi-signatures, that number tends to be lower. And that's really the number that needs to be improved. Thank you. It was a great presentation. It's obviously a very good technology. Um, I have three questions. <laughs> First of all, um, the problem with anonymity can be solved by using one-time addresses. So you don't use like BIP32, but for multi-signature. So you don't need to use the same signatures, I mean, for subsequent signing. So I mean, for businesses, it might be a solution. What, what do you think about that? Uh, yeah, let's, I will answer one by one. Yeah. So I think your question is, what can you solve the anonymity problem by taking a multi-sig address, sending it to a regular address, and then perhaps mixing it again and bringing it back to a multi-sig address. The problem with that is that you can have anonymity in the situation or security, but not both, because you're temporarily putting it through a single device, a single point of failure, a single regular address. And at that point, your Bitcoins are going to be vulnerable. We've given a good amount of thought to this. We couldn't find a way to maintain the trade-off in such a way that uh, uh, you have both of those properties, but I'd love to chat about it. Maybe there's a way to do it. But threshold signatures are definitely one way to do it. And I'm told that I'm out of time. Thank you very much, everyone, for listening. And I'd love to continue this conversation. Thanks again.